the Historical Commission. I wanted to welcome everybody to our final Black History Month event. Throughout our events this month, we have learned about the Reconstruction Era, the newest Reconstruction Era National Park, and we have learned about the history of Mount Pleasant schools, all Black African American schools in Mount Pleasant before integration, and we've also enjoyed a concert by the Plantation Singers. And tonight we're going to have a wonderful presentation on the history and upcoming museum, the International African American Museum. And following that, we will have a musical number by Miss Ann Caldwell of the Plantation Singers. Tonight we do have some of our historical commission members with us. Um, the mayor was not able to make it. He has been to every other event, but he's got a, he had a family event and he's traveling right now. But we do have some of our historical commission members here tonight. Courtney Tice is our vice chair. We have Daniel Cox, Pam Gabriel, and um, Rick Gatowski was actually our chair um, for eight years. And we have um, Colonel Chandler here, and Bill Hine is here and going to speak about the actual event and introduce our speakers. He is our Black History Month committee chair. And of course, Walter Brown. I want to say welcome, Walter Brown. He's on the commission and started our Black History Month celebration eight years ago. Uh, thank you. And again, I'm uh, William Hine, and I'd like to uh, thank each and every one of you uh, for uh, coming out this afternoon for our concluding Black History Month. Uh, program, as uh, Kate mentioned, the three previous ones have been uh, just excellent and uh, it will be hard to top those, but I think uh, we'll manage uh, today. We have two very special uh, guests uh, to talk about the uh, IAAM. Incidentally, I uh, Googled IAAM uh, a few days ago and up came the International, and this is true, the International Association of animal massages. <laughs> <laughs> so if your uh, great Dane is in need of uh, a treatment, uh, IAAM will uh, will get it. Uh, but uh, uh, the IAAM for us is the International African American Museum, and we're delighted to have the CEO and president, Dr. Uh, Anya Matthews, uh, and. Uh, Dr. Bernard Powers, who's on the board of uh, directors. Dr. Matthews has a really a remarkable uh, background, uh, superb preparation for uh, the museum here in Charleston and the Low Country. She's combined science and humanities. Uh, she's got an undergraduate degree from Duke University and then, then a uh, PhD in, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bio, Biomedical Engineering. Biomedical Engineering. I can't even say it, I'm to <laughs> study it. Uh, and uh, she's worked extensively in STEM area science, encouraging young women to get into science, engineering, and math. But she's also got a passion for uh, history, worked uh, deeply in uh, historical projects, I've uh, been experienced with museums in Cincinnati and Detroit. She's a published uh, poet, uh, just a remarkable, remarkable uh, background. Dr. Powers, I think some of you already know, I've known him for uh, many years, uh, in fact, decades. I think I first met uh, Dr. Powers back in the 1980s when he was a professor at the College of Charleston and I was, if I remember correctly, I think I was in elementary school uh, at that uh, time. Uh, I'm looking up to his uh, leadership uh, over uh, the College of Charleston. He's retired now, but he's the director of the uh, Institute for the Study of Slavery in Charleston. So enough of my uh, traveling on here. I'll let uh, Dr. Matthews and Dr. Powers uh, 
much uh, for that introduction. I will see and folks can let me know. I think I've got these two minutes that are hot in front of me. I want to thank all of you, uh, not only for inviting Dr. Carr and I here today, but to committing to the whole monthly program that you have done uh, and for putting Sister Carl to last. I have yet to make it through one of your solos without trying, so it is appropriate uh, <laughs> that I be able to speak uh, in front of that. Uh, and for all of you who have been in this work of unearthing history um, for, for much, much longer than I have, I also want to say thank you. I am a product of the work that you all have been doing, and I am excited, very, very excited to be working on uh, this project uh, and to be between my two hometowns. Uh, my family uh, is in Washington, D.C. I am from from. Uh, D.C., which my mother makes me say, because we have a lot of transplants, and apparently there's something about being born in the city proper. Uh, I hear tell folks in Charleston know a little something about that. Uh, and the other half of my family is New Orleans. Uh, so I am right here uh, in the middle of it all. Uh, and so um, I know that in many ways I'm going to be speaking to the choir uh, as I talk about our journey um, towards creating the International African American Museum. I'm going to do sort of a big picture overview, uh, and then Dr. Paz is actually going to talk to you about sort of what it's about and what's, what's behind this. So many of you know that we are being constructed at the site of Gadsden's Wharf. There's a nice before and after. Some of you may be excited. That second picture, of course, strikes fear into the heart of everyone in charge of such a an ambitious uh, construction project. Um, as was mentioned in my bio, part of my background is in engineering, so never give an engineer a time-lapse video because she is in her element. <laughs> <laughs> so as you sort of walk uh, some of the spaces and places that we have been through, part of one of the first things that we did was the archeological dig necessary for building at this site. So Gadsden's Wharf is known as one of the most prolific slave trading ports uh, in our nation's history. And us grappling uh, with how to build and where to build inside of that space, even as we were uncovering our uh, history prior to that, has been a big part of, of what we're doing. Uh, and so we've got hallowed ground uh, in that space, but we've also got sacred joy uh, that we are looking to restore to that space. Part of, of the way that I come into this space is thinking that one of the greatest gifts that African Americans can give to our nation, if not to the world, is our ability to simultaneously hold these spaces of trauma and joy. It's not trauma on Tuesday, joy on Thursday. It is just sort of all of it kind of together. And this is, this is not just a gift, it is a well-earned skill set. Uh, and I think studying the untold story of the African American journey can help all of us sort of take some of that in uh, and learn that space. And you'll see, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of that has gone into the design of our building and our space. So first, the building uh, itself, uh, designed by renowned architect Henry Cobb. Um, and as we told him about the space, as we told him about what we would be trying to do in that space, he came to an understanding that he said was going to be then one of the greatest challenges of his architectural career, which was designing a building for which the ground was more important than the building that he was designing. And out of that reflection, what he decided is that even the museum itself would not touch the ground. That is actually why we are raised on top of 18, 13 foot pillars. Out of his respect uh, for the story and what we were doing. There are also some other really incredible elements you can see straight through one end of the building to the other, a bit of a nod to the flowing of energy and spirit uh, through, through the spaces. So we start with, with the building. And then we come to our first floor, which is actually the African Ancestors Memorial Garden. This is our outside space that is underneath and surrounding the building. So with that, we work with landscape architect uh, Walter Hood, an amazing, amazing uh, African-American gentleman out of the West Coast. He is now a MacArthur Genius Award winner. Luckily, we've been working on the project long enough that this was pre-genius negotiation <laughs> uh, that, that we did with him. Uh, sort of in this in this space, and so he has curated um, this outside experience, and is really helping us grapple with this simultaneous the wholeness of this story. So, for example, if you look to um, let's see, 
On your side is going to be, yes, the far left, the picture of the young man sort of walking through the pages. As I mentioned, um, part of the archaeological dig helped us to discover some of the elements of the place that was before. Now, this was a port, a slave trading port. And while we talk about these enslaved individuals today as people and as humans, we must understand that at the time, we're talking cargo, right? We're talking, we're talking livestock. And so you will find elements of that when you do the dig, right? And so one of these elements was the storage house. Because as you're bringing in your cargo, as you're importing your goods, you gotta have a place to store things, to inspect things, to label things. And maybe if the market's not quite right, you wanna hold things in place until the price goes up to create some, some scarcity. And so we knew this and we, we unearthed this space. Rather than recreating uh, the storage house, we did not actually want to have that kind of element and experience, we um, honored it with an outline. So it's a one-dimensional brick outline uh, built into the place. And so the two granite walls that you're looking at, they actually cross over uh, that storage space. Part of what we know about the story of the storage house is that the historical record tells of an unexpected chill uh, that came through the low country, hit the, the Charleston region quite, quite hard. And on this particular occasion, 700 souls um, who were being held in the storage house waiting for their price to go up perished uh, in a single event. And so we've got to think through um, honoring that and knowing that this is indeed a poignant part of the story. So we have these two walls covered with polished black granite, polished so, uh, so um, sincerely that you can actually see your reflection in it. It's almost like a mirror looking back and forth. And inside, Walter has installed um, artistic elements um, carved, crouching, kneeling figures to honor what has happened. These are some of the earliest renditions. Dr. Powers and I have been in conversation with Walter Hood and his, and his team, and as we've continued to sit in the story, the design of those figures has morphed a bit. So now as you're going to be looking at these, at these figures, as you head towards the water, what you're going to be looking at are figures emerging out of concrete. And the closer, the farther you walk, the more emerged the figures will be all here, and on the outside of these granite walls will be inscribed the Maya Angelou quote, and still I rise. Mm -hmm. So this is part of the way that we want to deal with the complexity and the wholeness of the story at all times. Uh, top of the picture, you will see our infinity reflection pool, which is both an artistic and an engineering masterpiece. Uh, very small, uh, about five or six inches of water. Uh, there are motors underneath of it. Walter wanted to be in conversation with the ocean. So actually, the water rises and falls with the tide. That's actually what the motors are for that. It's difficult to see at this distance, but the artistic inlay um, at the bottom of our reflection pool has a couple of critical influences. The first is the conversation with the water, and so you'll see some things that look like ripples. The second is the inspiration of what are known as the Brooks images. So if you've ever seen uh, the diagrams of the way uh, enslaved peoples were packed, into the bottom of slave ships. Um, one of the most well-known of that are the Brooks images, and that was the other side of his inspiration for this. So that's what you're going to be able to see. You're going to be able to see vague outlines of, of people in that space, as well as reminiscing with the water. And again, it's about what we're bringing to the space and when. When I'm out there thinking about how this will work, sometimes I think about the water uh, sinking, and I think about those that we lost, and then I think about the water rising. And I think about those who were given the opportunity to choose to survive, and did so. The other fun conversation that we've been having is because it's, it's low to the ground, it's only five or six inches, how are we gonna stop people from walking through the pool? You know, my, my experience in museums says, we can't. Uh, and I was, I was here last July, we really can't uh, in, in terms of that. But I noticed that in this particular um, uh, rendition that, that one of our um, uh, architects did for us, that there is a little, there's a little black girl with her, her afro cuffs sort of walking through the pool. And part of that, though, reminded me that this is about the joy. There's probably nothing more poignant than a child, perhaps even a descendant child, walking through this reflection pool as if she owns the space, as if she finds peace and joy in that space. So we'll try to make sure that I see the queen. 
uh, probably as far as we can go. Um, the last image is just a nod to the, the gardens, of the gardens. So we curated uh, the plants in the space into an ethnobotanical garden, meaning that each plant within the space was chosen for its relationship um, between uh, the low country, uh, the west coast of Africa, and some of our sister communities down in the Caribbean, uh, predominantly of Barbados, as we think about that. So that's what that means in terms of that. And so this is how we settle into the idea that this space, this place, has a story. And then of course, uh, when you walk into a museum, then we ask for the honor of telling you uh, more stories. So we've got nine core galleries, uh, including uh, a special exhibition, the Changing Gallery, that we'll be able to change out more often. Uh, I know better, no, we are not about to run through all nine galleries, no. Uh, so I just wanna point out three of our galleries to sort of give you an idea of, of how we're approaching some of the stories as a national museum uh, that will lean into the international story and context of African Americans, but also to own the home team, which is that we are a Charleston low country organization. So the first, we do get the conversation, so how is this different from other African American museums in the country? In particular, this is great, because we've also got that brand new one up in Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian. So what are the relationships? Do you partner? What are the differences? So the Smithsonian um, and the International African American Museum are what we call encyclopedic history museums. And that means we take a long swatch of time and tell multiple stories inside of that time, hence the term encyclopedic. So we are in the same kind and type of African American museum. Um, and uh, after that, uh, when we are finished completion of the International African American Museum, we will be the second largest of our kind in the country. Uh, in terms of that. Many, many of you, you look like museum folks, you know that most museums are not really that big, particularly African American and other ethno-specific museums as well. Um, so we will be quite a prominent figure uh, inside the landscape. From there, there are several key differentiators uh, between our museum and any other museum in the country. Our Gullah Geechee Gallery uh, is one of the epitomes of that. Now, what I know is that every museum in the country should say a little bit of something about uh, the Gullah Geechee peoples, but without question. Here in the low country, we could arguably tell the story best. Um, this gallery represents for us our biggest opportunity and our biggest challenge in the same thing, and that is that we are talking about a living culture, right? So the advantage is, of course, that folks still here. <laughs> and can tell you uh, the, the story and, and can bring this to you. And the disadvantage is that folks still here. So when they come in and they're looking at you tell the story, they know what it is, right? And so, so we want to be um, very conscious of that and take that into advantage. And the other thing is, when you have galleries that talk about cultures, we're used to museums telling us about ancient and foregone cultures, right? So we must be sure to communicate um, to our very large national uh, and international visiting audience, but no, 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 no. We're, we're talking about folks who are, who are right here, as well as introducing. And, and of course, I'm going to be repeating something that many of, of you know in the room, but what we get into this gallery is we talk about the, the origins um, and the resilience of the Gullah peoples, the Gullah Geechee uh, community, came out of a couple of primary things. Um, one was a part of the strategy of slavery. Um, was to do everything you could to get folks from forming communities so that they could rise up, right? We don't want them to be able to communicate. We don't want them to be able to relate to each other. We don't want them to be able to form a community and thus decide uh, that they would like to, to be free. So one of the strategies was to mix and mingle. We put together warring tribes, warring communities, folks that could not speak the same language, folks that had histories of strife. We put them all together. And the idea for that is you don't have the same language, you know, when you like each other, you may be enemies, great. You cannot come together, form a language, form a community, and you will never rise up. I'm happy to report, greatest failed social experiment ever. Um, because out of that, what you get is the Gullah Geechee uh, people did indeed form a single culture, did indeed form a single language, did of course indeed uh, form a uh, rekindle of the spirit of freedom. The second is the uniqueness of the geography, uh, particularly in this area and along the coast. Um, the isolation and the inhospitable, inhospitability mm, 
Um, <laughs> the C Islands sort of helped into that. I, um, as a new, as a new arrive, uh, arrivee, uh, have met your state bird. You got people all calling a mosquito. And so, <laughs> they, they are out there, sort of, sort of on these, on these islands. And what that meant is that in many ways, the management of the plantation system was a little bit different than it was in some other places. So that it was more like a, a business, and folks might have their homes where they're staying the majority of time in other places. Part of the thought is that that distance may have made the preservation of culture a little less aggressive, a little less challenging, sometimes out of sight, out of mind, which also added a layer in which uh, the Gullah and Nkichi peoples could continue to form their own communities and their own languages. And then, of course, after slavery, um, these were not the communities that got the first round of infrastructure uh, invested. No roads, no bridges, no easy ways on and off. While there are clear disadvantages to that, one of the things that it did do was offer a few more generations of building uh, and creating the stickiness uh, of the culture. So we're very excited about the space. We'll have a, uh, a couple of elements that we're really proud of. We're recreating a praise house. Uh, inside of this gallery, we got permission from some of our neighbors over on John's Island uh, to record a worship service, and we will be showing film and footage of that worship service inside of the house. We were able to commission a uh, bateau uh, made in the old style. This is, of course, a boat um, that was used by many of the folks who were in the sort of water and seafaring um, kind of space. And of course, we will indeed explain uh, the sweet grass basket, but hopefully, uh, folks will. will that it's a lot more than that. So Carolina Gold is our gallery that will talk about slavery itself, right? It will talk about the brutality, it will talk about the inhumanity. We always get that question, you're gonna tell the authentic story, right? You're not going to wash any of this over. Yes and absolutely. But what I am very proud of is that our approach is to tell the authentic story of the brutality and the inhumanity without losing the humanity of the enslaved individuals themselves, right? So we're focusing on both. So we do give a, a raw, unadulterated uh, picture and conversation of what it was like to be enslaved, but we also deliberately focus on the skills and the genius that the enslaved peoples were bringing uh, to this space and to this land. So uh, for example, of course, Carolina Gold, uh, that, that is our rights. Um, and one of the things we talked about is that South Carolina was a fairly hospitable climate to all of the major cash crops. We had a little cotton, we did a little indigo, we dabbled in the rice, right? All over the state, we had those various things. What the record will show is that dabbled in rice is a really good description prior to understanding um, that there were African communities that were ricing uh, communities. And so after the importation of enslaved peoples who were coming from ricing communities, that is actually when um, the South Carolina, Carolina Gold ricing um, industry system was able to take off. And then this became deliberate. You can actually look at the roles and see that if an enslaved person was being sold into this environment and they came from a rising community, there was a higher fee for that individual because it was understood of uh, the skill set and the understanding of technology that they were bringing into this space. After uh, this began to happen, uh, the rising industry here boomed. At one point, at the high point, um, South Carolina was actually exporting more rice to the world than China. Uh, so folks were very, very good uh, at what they were doing. And so in this gallery, we are also then able to dip into uh, the craftsmanship uh, that was going on. And so we talk about the black potters of Edgefield, we talk about David Blake. Uh, this would be where we have uh, one of his pieces. Um, this is also where you can see some of our partnerships. We will be the uh, long-term loan holders of Ashley Sack which is actually in the permanent collection of Middleton Place, uh, also here. Um, we're excited that Ashley Sack has returned home uh, in anticipation of the museum. It has been at the Smithsonian uh, since their opening, um, and we worked with Middleton Place to bring it back and put it on long-term loan uh, with us. Um, Ashley Sack, for anyone who, who hasn't heard of it, um, is also one of the ways we will remind ourselves we were also talking about family, and we were also talking about children sort of engaged in, engaged in this space. And the, the sack um, was given to uh, a young girl and what was inscribed was the story of the various women um, that she was sold away from across a few generations. And what was included, a comb, a hair barrette, um, and the last line reminds her that, that she came from love and not from nothing. 
uh, so that she would have that. And so that's part of the complexity that we add to the way that we tell the story about slavery and enslavement. Last gallery um, is the American Journeys uh, Gallery, which is um, our largest gallery. It actually has two halves. And so this is essentially where we tell um, the American story, but of course overlay uh, an African-American lens to this story. I think folks will like this gallery um, because we all have our favorite moments and things in, in history. And I think that whenever you go into a museum, it's great to feel like you're learning something, but you also want that, that little space, oh, I need that. Right? Everybody wants to well, I need that uh, space. And I think this is the gallery where a lot of folks will be able to find that. It's also one of our most artifact-rich uh, galleries. So what you're looking at up here is um, a tennis racket that we'll have in our collection from Althea Gibson, uh, first African-American woman at Wimbledon. Uh, we'll have um, some records. You know, the record itself is not the artifact. Uh, the, the record was used to record um, some Negro spirituals. Um, and we have um, some things like that. Uh, we also have a first edition signed copy of Up From Slavery um, from Booker T. Washington, founder of the Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University. This is also one of the places where we can lean into the Carolina lens, right? So when we're talking about particular moments in time. So for example, we will do the civil rights movement and where some communities may lean into Rosa Parks, we will lean into Cecilia Clark, because she's out. Uh, when we talk about the jazz age, some folks may lean into Satchmo. We, sorry New Orleans, will lean into Dizzy Gillespie because he's actually ours. And so these are also ways, while still being a national museum uh, with our, or that international conversation, that we can lean into um, what we do best uh, on the space. So the place has a story, we'd like to tell you a story, and then we invite folks uh, to tell us their own story and learn their story. One of the quintessentially unique things about the International African American Museum will be the Center for Family History, our very own world-class genealogy research library. Um, and it's not just a closet or a notion, it's a big, beautiful space uh, where we will have stations where folks can work on their genealogy, will be staffed with um, uh, researchers and genealogists, to help folks along their journey. It's for the amateur, I just heard this is a thing, maybe you actually get started, to folks who've been doing this for quite some time. They have become the default family historian. Um, and perhaps they'd like to learn stories about the names they found and they, they need to know where to go next, or perhaps they've gotten stuck. One of the reasons um, we, we moved in this direction um, and that this is so special is that there are some particular challenges to African American and that, of course, um, is largely based around the institution of slavery. So one, you've got families being separated at rapid and unprecedented paces, right? So folks are being separated and spread. The second is um, things like the Wall of 1870. So it was not until 1870 where African and African Americans were recorded by name in the U.S. Census. So you will get to that space, and in that like, sort of key set of documents, we can no longer find names. And I would say that from some of my own journey, even after that, folks didn't really care how they wrote the name down uh, in, in terms of that. So also a lack of respect and thinking for about how you write those names down. And so we're developing uh, techniques and wisdom and sensitivity around that fact. So some traditional things such as military records. Um, even prior to the, the wall, the military was very, very good and very, very strict about keeping records, about who was engaged. Uh, there were also some records perhaps a little more sticky, I like to say, such as uh, the slave roads, where masters were loaning out their property uh, to other individuals uh, for, for use and, and for labor. Rest assured, because people wanted their property back, the level of detail in those records um, is really good. And as sticky as it is, it also adds another element of information. Now you don't just have the names, you're also gonna have the skill set. You're also gonna have some information about where folks have traveled to. Uh, and, and where they had where they have been. And so that also brings in a whole wealth of information. Um, we're also leaning into quote unquote non-traditional things. So we've currently got a call out right now for your great grandmother's Bible. Um, we're sure many communities do this, but African Americans in particular. Ours was the red leather bound Bible with the gold letters on it. Everything gets stuck in that Bible. You know, the baptism papers, the, the wedding announcements, all of that goes into the Bible. So that is also a really good way of understanding and tracking history. We do not keep the Bibles, we just ask for permission to image them 
so we can add them to, to our archives um, and leave other strings and strands for folks to pull. We've also developed some, some additional active listening ears, which is more of a, a metaphor, um, around oral histories, right? So usually in oral histories, you're focusing on the people and the names, but also focusing on the incidents and moments that folks will talk about. And they say, well, you know, it wasn't, they, they moved right after the great storm. I don't exactly know when and exactly, but they moved right after the great storm, but we have to move pretty far because that whole region was just wiped out. Things like that can be found in other kinds of records. So if you can narrow down the great storm, you can narrow down the region, um, then again, you've got some, some additional information. So thinking through uh, those, those kinds of things, um, and we've also got some incredible partnerships with genealogy databases um, all over the world, um, in particular, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, um, which, uh, if you are not familiar, does indeed have the largest genealogical database on the planet. Uh, and they, in the recent years, they have been very, very particular about expanding their global, um, the, the globalness of their genealogy, so we're also very, very excited uh, about that. Uh, and so that is essentially uh, the, the overview there, uh, sort of the, the concept of, I think, a museum without walls, history is not was, it is, and sort of getting folks, I think, into uh, that space. Uh, and I'm hoping that as folks come, the one thing you will take away is that there is so much more to learn and you are excited about that fact um, in terms of that. And so we also want to have the kind of partnerships that allow us to be conduit so when people ask us the question, so what next and where can I go, we can actually answer those questions. Everything from additional historical sites to where can I get some authentic Gullah cookies. <laughs> uh, and with that, I'm going to switch out the PowerPoints here for uh, my uh, board member and mentor, Dr. Bernard Powell. Oh, sure.
Okay, so uh, let's go right here. So we want to do at least three things in this museum. Uh, we want to we want to place the African American experience in the larger framework of Atlantic history and world history. And we argue that you really cannot fully appreciate the African American experience unless you look at its connections to the larger world. And so uh, wherever we can make those connections to international development, we, we do that. And that's a process that's ongoing, and we're going to flesh that out uh, much more completely as we um, institute different kinds of programming, as we have changing exhibits, and so on and so forth. Uh, but in addition, we want everyone who comes to the museum to leave with an understanding that in critically important ways, the African American experience has shaped, has shaped not only American history, but critically important international events and development. This is not just a story that is a parochial, you know, uh, when people think of African American history, they automatically think of the American South, the Great Migration to Northern cities and Western cities, and civil rights, and that's really about it. But actually, all of those elements, all of those phases, have important international connections. And each one of those elements, the South, the Great Migration, and so on and so forth, uh, can be linked to important developments in international and world history that African Americans had an impact on. And then the final thing that we want people to take away from the museum is this. Regardless of who you are, regardless of your racial background, this is your story also. This story touches your life, and it has had an impact, and it shapes your life. And so we want to accomplish all of those things. Now, what I want to do uh, this afternoon is talk a bit about some of the themes that unfold inside of the museum that Dr. Matthews has described. Uh, and, and again, I'm not going to go through all the, all the galleries because we have a lot of galleries. But I just want to give you all some examples to illustrate what I've just said and, uh, and what you're going to see going forward. Okay, so uh, so you have a, an image basically of uh, the Caribbean, and the first thing that, uh, that I want to point out to you all is right here, the island formerly known as Istanbul, where you got the Dominican Republic and Haiti there today, okay? So we're going to focus there first, and then we will we'll go forward. Okay. And here you have someone that most of you are familiar with, Toussaint Louverture, one of the main architects of the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804. Critically important, and among the several things that happened there, two are unprecedented even today, even today in world history. One, Haiti, formerly known as Saint-Domingue, this is the only place where these two things happen. One, people held in slavery liberated themselves and became free, fully free. But they also simultaneously cast off colonialism. The French controlled San Domingue, this part of the island of Hispaniola. So they became free from slavery and also successfully overthrew imperialism. And this is the only example in world history where people so shackled liberated themselves from both. Uh, take a look and you will see, I think, something particularly interesting in terms of, of international uh, events. And we'll look at it in this way and then we'll look at it in, in another So Toussaint here, uh, painting, and then, and then an Indian painting, and then a stamp. 
a sample of West African country of Benin today. Uh, and the story is that uh, Toussaint Overture was a descendant of a king from the kingdom of Dahomey, and today Dahomey is known as fundamentally the country of Benin. And so there's a, a modern era stamp uh, commemorating and recognizing Toussaint's life in the contemporary country of, of Benin. Uh, here's the second element of the international story that we want to talk about. And again, this is something that everyone here is at least somewhat familiar with, uh, the Louisiana Purchase, the Louisiana Purchase Festival. And the point here is that uh, the Louisiana Purchase occurs in 1803. You all will recall that Napoleon will sell this huge block of territory to Thomas Jefferson, and he does that after the Haitian Revolution. Because Haiti, and you recall what Haiti looked like, it wasn't even all of the island of Hispaniola, was much more valuable than all of it because it was a sugar producing island. And one of the most uh, uh, prolific sources of sugar in all of the Caribbean. And so once Napoleon lost that, this area, which wasn't even inhabited yet, and the French really didn't even know what was in here, they decided, well, we better get rid of it because it is, uh, its value has plummeted. And the Americans right next door may perhaps just invade and occupy it. And remember, this is during the course of a, of a lull in the Napoleonic Wars, primarily between the French and the British. And so that's how we end up getting the Louisiana Purchase, which literally doubles the size of the extant United States. Doubles the size of the U.S. And uh, that is made possible by the successful slave revolution, the slave revolt, that occurs in Haiti. In Haiti. And, and, and now, there's an irony to this, too. There's an irony. Look here. Uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, Missouri, here. All of those places become slave states. So look at what happened. The liberation of enslaved people in one place forges the shackles on African people in other places in the U.S., unfortunately. That's a, that's a cool irony. Uh, let's, uh, let's, take, uh, let's take another look at something that y'all are familiar with, the American Revolution. You know, if you were to ask the average person, what's the connection between slavery and the American Revolution, they look at you and they say, well, there's no connection. What are you talking about? The American Revolution is all about the the abuse of the, uh, the rights of Anglo-English people, and it's all about unfair taxes on tea and glass and so on and so forth, doesn't have anything to do with slavery. You know, and, that's, and that's what people are taught. Except we know that, for example, in the original draft in the Declaration of Independence, one of the things that Thomas Jefferson wrote there in this long series of indictments against King George III was that King George III was guilty of inciting race war in America in order to put down the revolution. And what Jefferson meant was that British soldiers and policymakers and royal governors were encouraging enslaved people to run away from their Anglo-American owners and come over to their side and to assist them in, in suppressing the revolution. Well, that was race war. That was race war. And of course, if British policymakers could sink to such an abysmal and low level, they could never be trusted. And white Americans would never live safely under that kind of rule. Now, as it turns out, as it turns out, there's only a vague reference to that 
that set of problems and that set of issues in the final version of the Declaration of Independence. And there are a number of reasons for that. So you have to look at the original draft to really, to really appreciate that. That's one way, that's one way that slavery played a role in the coming of the American Revolution. But I want y'all to think about, think about something else. Uh, you know, most of the, uh, the African descended people that, that either fight or in other way participate in the revolution uh, support the British side. And of course, there's Americans in the jungle that I talked about. Uh, but that's what happened because so many people of African descent uh, believed that there were a number of, there were some ironic reasons why they thought this. They thought that their best hope of obtaining freedom was on the British side and doing something to support them. And so many more African Americans ran away from their owners, joined the British side, some fought for the British. Others uh, were, were laborers in fortification and so on and so forth. Now, you know, we know all about Gaston's War and thousands of Africans entered through Gaston's War and entered into slavery through Gaston's War. But that door swung in two directions. It swung in two directions. And most people don't know about the second direction. In other words, they know about folk who came in and entered into slavery. But guess what? After the American Revolution, there were thousands of African people exited out through Gaston's War when the British evacuated. And thousands of those African descended people who had supported them in one way or other left with them. And it went to various parts of the British Empire. And many of them remained free. So that door swung in two directions. And we want people to have an appreciation of that. Let me just give you, let me just give you these two examples. George Lyle on the left and David George. Uh, and they, they, they show, again, some of these international connections that African Americans have to the larger Atlantic Rim and the Caribbean. Uh, both these men were uh, born in Virginia, and they, uh, by different means, made their way down to South Carolina. Uh, George Lyle, George Lyle, uh, was brought down to Carolina uh, with his uh, with his uh, owner, and. Uh, David George, as it turns out, was a fugitive slave. And both of them ended up uh, down in South Carolina. And during the time of the American Revolution, by, by that point, the 1770s, uh, these men who were very religious had become ministers. And uh, they were involved in preaching to enslaved people along the Savannah River, starting down at uh, uh, the city of Savannah and extending uh, up the Savannah River. And, <clears throat> and during the time of the American Revolution, they would manage to get within the British lines. And when the evacuation occurred, they would evacuate with the British. And uh, George Lyle, George Lyle, for example, will uh, leave and go down to Jamaica. And he'll go down to Jamaica and will become a, a very uh, important source of the Baptist religious tradition there, introducing the Baptist church. And uh, David George would uh, go north, ends up going to Canada, and ultimately to Sierra Leone in West Africa. So when that door swung open to freedom, you had African people who left the United States and went to other parts of the world. And in the case of these men, uh, played prominent roles in the new communities and the new countries that they became uh, a part of. Edward Jones, Edward Jones, 
1807 to 1865, uh, a black Charlestonian. And Edward Jones was the son of one of the most famous black Charlestonians in the antebellum period, G. Boo Jones, who was a very wealthy free black, owned, uh, as some of you all know, a hotel down on Broad Street. Well, this is one of his sons. And Edward Jones was educated at, guess where? Amherst University. Graduated from there in 1826. One of the earliest African Americans to graduate from Amherst. And then Edward Jones, who uh, would become a minister, leaves the United States, goes to Sierra Leone in West Africa, where he would become the first president of what eventually became Fora Bay College, Fora Bay College, Freetown, Sierra Leone, uh, established in 1827. Uh, 18, and Fora Bay College is the first institution of higher education in all of Sub-Saharan Africa in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And, uh, and he would become the leader of that institution, which would then go on and contribute vitally to the production of a West African educational elite, uh, many uh, members of which would go on to do and serve in very prominent roles in terms of the development of West Africa, uh, religious, uh, uh, Western religious uh, expansion, uh, educational development, commerce, and so on and so forth. Bishop Samuel uh, J. Crowder, uh, 1807 and 1891, uh, was a person who, who would have during the time period been classified as a re-captive, a re-captive. And what happened was Sierra Leone in West Africa uh, became, beginning in 1808 and afterwards, the center from which the British Naval Squadron began to suppress the Atlantic slave trade along the coast of West Africa. And there were, there were treaties that the British signed with various uh, European nations, primarily, uh, to get them to end the Atlantic slave trade. And when vessels were found illegally engaged in the trade, the British intercepted those vessels and they towed them into Freetown and liberated uh, the captives. Uh, Samuel J. Crowder was one such person who was liberated from one of those ships in the early 1820s. And so he is settled in uh, Freetown where he will go to school, and of course you know where he eventually goes, Fort Bay College, and then after Fort Bay to uh, Great Britain, where he'll attend Oxford University, takes a doctoral degree, becomes a minister in the Anglican Church, and by 1864, he, and, 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 and he would have returned uh, to uh, Sierra Leone before 1864. But by 1864, he will be ordained as the first African bishop in the Anglican Church with responsibility for West Africa. And then uh, uh, James Africanus Horton, uh, another prominent descendant of uh, recaptives in Sierra Leone. Uh, he was born in Sierra Leone. His parents had been uh, taken off of one of those uh, illicitly and illegally uh, slave trading uh, uh, vessels engaged in the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, and he would uh, be educated at Fort Bay College again. And eventually goes to Scotland, attends the University of Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh and uh, takes a medical degree there becomes a part of the British Medical Service in the Gold Coast, today's Ghana, and Sierra Leone. Uh, James Africanus Horton uh, was a prolific writer also, and uh, he was one who wrote uh, extensively about traditional African culture and history and also the, the right
rights of African people, the rights of African people. Remember, this time period we're talking about the late 19th century was a period of rising racism internationally. And African people uh, were being uh, assaulted on every side and accused uh, of racial inferiority and so on and so forth. And James African and Horton would write in response to those, those false and widespread accusations in the attempt to vindicate the historical record and the achievements of African people. Again, a product of Flora Bay College and, and the first uh, principal, in effect, the founding principal Flora Bay College has a connection to where Charleston, South Carolina. It's an international story, an international story that we seek to tell at this, at this museum. Let me just quickly uh, touch on a couple of, couple of other points. And uh, Dr. Matthews uh, referred to the American Journeys Gallery, which is this U-shaped gallery right here. Uh, the eastern part of the museum that I've been talking about is organized thematically, uh, topically, and the American Journeys Gallery is organized chronologically. So it, it, it's essentially a walkthrough of American and South Carolina history with an eye toward examining those critically important uh, points uh, and, uh, and, and, and episodes in, in U.S. and South Carolina history where the African American present can play a critically important role. And uh, and this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. Uh, there are the walls uh, that comprise that U shape that I walked you through is partition. And uh, there are documents and there are images and there are artifact cases that you can see. And uh, as I said, it's organized chronologically. So if you're interested in the Civil War, you can walk down to a section that will be labeled probably something like 1860 to 1865 and spend your time there. Or if you're interested in World War II, it will be similarly labeled and so on and, and, and so forth. Uh, this, is, this is the Man Simmons uh, site, which is up in Columbia, which is an example of a piece of real estate that uh, was owned by African Americans in the Columbia area dating back to the 1840s. So it begins as a property owned by a few blacks and uh, remained in the family until the 1970s. And there were several businesses that operated out of this, out of this site. Uh, George Elmore, uh, also from Columbia, critically important in, in South Carolina in the struggle for the civil rights. Uh, the famous case, uh, Elmore versus Rice, 1946-1947, in which uh, Elmore Rice, uh, his attorney was Thurgood Marshall, and Elmore Rice would successfully challenge the South Carolina uh, uh, white, Democratic white primary. Democratic black primary, expanding the franchise for African Americans, not only in South Carolina, but in the nation. Uh, Dr. Matthews referred to this, this uh, episode, uh, sitting on the left, Septima Clark, and Septima Clark, uh, as uh, some of you all know, lost her job with the Charleston County Board of Education, ended up going up to the Highlander uh, folk Center in uh, Tennessee and taught up there. Uh, that was a center that produced many labor activists, civil rights activists, and so on and so forth. And uh, on one occasion, in the time period we were talking about this late uh, 50s, the late 1950s, and on one occasion, Rosa Parks, Rosa Parks, on um, Rosa Parks on the right was her student, was her student. And Rosa said that uh, she was just in awe 
of September, and after studying with her, uh, she had much more confidence as an activist. And shortly after that, she rode the bus into town. Now, okay, uh, bring, to bring this to a close, uh, we know that we cannot get the whole experience uh, within the walls of the museum. And so we want you to come to the museum, get an orientation, uh, see some things that are thought provoking, some things that will pique your interest, and then we want you to go out. We want you to go out and walk through the city of Charleston. We want you to walk or drive or however you're going to get from one place to the other, take the bus uh, around the state of South Carolina and in the U.S. and ultimately to international locations that we'll send you to at this International African American Museum, which will serve as your point of orientation. Just uh, to give you a few quick examples, St. Augustine, uh, Castillo St. Marcos uh, Fort, which has been there since probably the late 16th century. When you go down to Castillo St. Marcos, there's a timeline on that fort. And in that long timeline, it says in 1740, this fort was attacked by the British. So you look at it and you say, well, I guess the British just woke up one morning and they said, well, we don't have anything else to do. Let's just, <laughs> let's just drive on down to St. Augustine and attack the Spanish fort, right? Except we know that's not what happened. There was, a, there was a series of events that led up to this, and the most critically important one was the Stono Rebellion that occurred in 1739. Ronald Stono uh, river just below Charleston. And uh, the British argued that the Stono Rebellion had been inspired by and, and, and had been called for by the Spanish authorities down in Florida. So the 1740 British attack was in retaliation for what they believed uh, Spain had done to Florida. Now, this is an international story because it involves Great Britain, one nation, and Spain. It's an international story, and we have to think about it in that way. And there are a lot of ways in which African American history intersected with American foreign policy. We don't normally think about that, but, uh, but that's certainly correct. Uh, the uh, African-derived community in Britain has been, <clears throat> well, the black presence in Britain dates back to Roman times, to Roman times. Uh, but that community expands dramatically, dramatically in the 18th century and afterwards, and particularly after World War II, uh, when large numbers of people from, people of color, from the British Empire uh, migrate to uh, the mother country there, and you will see one of the most famous ships that brings large numbers of Caribbean immigrants uh, to Britain in 1948, the Windrush, the Windrush. And so those, those people who came in 18, 1948 are referred to as the, the Windrush generation. And uh, of course, they and those who came afterwards changed the racial and complexion and face of Great Britain. And there are debates uh, in British society today, right, in, in, in the UK today, over who is legitimately part of the, uh, the United Kingdom and who is legitimately British. And if you are Nigerian, can you really be considered British? You know, the racist phrase, those kinds of uh, questions. Uh, and so, interestingly enough, if you go to Great Britain today, you can take African American history tours, like history tours, in London, in London. Uh, this is Barbados, uh, Cropover celebration, just an example of the kind of celebratory uh, things that happen throughout the Caribbean, you know, based on African-derived uh, dance.
that same tradition and so on and so forth. In Barbados, there was always a celebration after the harvest was, uh, was completed. The people would go out and celebrate dancing and food and so on. Uh, very, very much like, uh, but, but, but different than carnival. And just a continuation of that. Uh, there, these are, these are all episodes, uh, uh, examples of crop over. And uh, Dr. Matthews has talked about the sense of family history. That's the percentage of it. And I want to thank you for coming out today and for your attention. And there's our website, IAMIAAMuseum.org. And thank you all very much. Presentations. Did anybody from the audience have any questions for our presenters? I can bring you the mic. No, George Elmo. <laughs> Mulatto, businessman, on Harden Street in Columbia, South Carolina, across from Allen University. He operated a fleet of cars. He operated the Carver Theater, and he had a five and down. Now, because he was the test case to open up the white Democratic primary for Afro-Americans, the banks cut off his line of credit. George died penniless. But what he had left two daughters what the black teachers in Columbia, South Carolina did, and I was one of them. I taught there from 1955 to 1958. We decided every payday, I was the collector at my school, Fairwall in Greenview. We collected $5 from each black teacher, and we educated those two girls, and they graduated from Benedict College. Anticipated uh, opening day, or maybe month and year. Anticipated years. opening day. Uh, we are working toward uh, opening this year, so late 2022. Probably about as late as I can get. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward, so forward to it opening, and uh, since we're so eagerly awaiting Ann Caldwell, how prominently will the spirituals be incorporated into the museum? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, one of our major divisions is actually our faith-based initiatives. We actually have an endowed program inside of the museum uh, led by our Reverend Jeanette Jenkins. So we are very, very excited to be deliberately incorporating that into our work, um, but also in terms of telling the full and the whole story, even our Interfaith Advisory Council um, has a variety. So of course we have uh, Christian, Jewish, and um, uh, Islamic representatives, but also we've got a Buddhist, we've got some Baha'i also sort of bringing those stories because of course, African-American, African spiritualism was a big part of our story as well. So yes, thank you for that. And then just, just, just to add to that too, uh, the area underneath the building and the garden adjacent are uh, areas where you're gonna, it'll be possible to hear some sounds. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're in the process of determining what people will hear and, 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 and they may, they may hear some uh, segments of, of spirituals mixed in with other music along with African languages, perhaps, and the sound of a, of a ship through the ocean. There could be a variety of sounds.
time, uh, but we're going to activate uh, that 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 space with with sound. Jenkins is there. Yeah. And I tell this story all the time, and, and it's, it's unbelievable. Folk can't believe it. But I graduated from Avery in 1951. There were four black high schools in Charleston County. Lang, East of the Cooper, ICS, Black Private Catholic School, Avery Institute, and Perth High School. In 1951, there was no black high school in North Charleston, no Barnes Rosen. There was no black high school West Ashley. So Esau Jenkins school operated buses to take blacks to the Navy Yard, bring the black women to Charleston, who worked as nannies for the rich and the wealthy on the battery. He also brought the children because their education stopped at sixth grade. So their parents used the relative's address in the city of Charleston so they could go to Burke High School. Now the parents had very little, those that could afford to pay, pay. Well, Esau Jenkins had a vision. He approached Charleston County Council to establish a black high school west of the Ashley. And that high school was Hot Gap. The land where Hot Gap Middle School sits today belongs to the Black Presbytery of Johns Island. Presbyterians are very, very strong on Johns Island. And he established, was instrumental in getting the first black high school east of the couple. He was my friend because I took children everywhere, but I couldn't use the white state school buses. So I used Esau Jenkins, and I took my kids everywhere, everywhere. You know, one thing about the book, with all this history around Charleston, you put them on the bus and you take them. Well, I had a black principal who said I couldn't do it because the orders came from the white superintendent. So I found a way. I took them on Saturday. Took them on Saturday. Never lost a child. 45 students and me. My question is, aside from memberships, how can the community get involved to support you? Thank you uh, for assuming that everyone here is already a charter member. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I think um, a couple things, of course, as you mentioned, membership, but also we also have our volunteer roles open now in preparation for opening the museum uh, for our extroverts and, and those who still love 10 year olds. Uh, and, and teenagers, of course, we have, uh, we're gonna have space for uh, volunteer docents to actually be on the, the floors of the museum, but we're also a business, we're also some back of house uh, needs that we will have um, as well. Uh, and I would also say that we will be ongoing as we get started in terms of uh, spreading the word about the museum and, and ambassadors. Um, and as one of my team members said the other day, even this year, we are beginning to launch our program. And so another critical thing is for folks to show up uh, for our programs. We had genealogy workshops this month. We had um, four of them. Um, our lowest attended one was 186 um, folks. So we're excited uh, in terms of that. So I think also um, uh, showing up for those kinds of things. And as you hear about the museum and conversation, 
uh, talk about how excited uh, you are um, and how much you would like to support. And if you feel like there's someone uh, in your community or your business relationship that needs to know more about the museum and are not connected yet, please reach out to us and them and, and make those uh, connections. And on a personal note, I would say, I arrived during COVID and I still have not met a lot of people. So if you are also thinking of folks um, to also introduce me uh, to the community and coming out to events like this, that would also be very helpful. Are there, will there be opportunities for volunteers? Yes, 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 yes. So even right now, you can go on our website um, and one of our drop downs has um, volunteers. I have help you just fill out a little form and maybe what you're interested in. So we have some, some one-off things, like perhaps when we start showing up and say the Big Tea Festival to do something big, they're like, I can give you a half a day. Or you may say, I can do every Tuesday, three to five o'clock, what might you need at that time? So we'll have lots of different opportunities for you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Dr. Zoli Clark, hi. Tonight, 
she is going to bless us with her vocals, but also um, share some storytelling as well. So if you join me in welcoming Miss Pablo. There are about 6,000 spirituals documented. And in the time that I have a lot of me, <laughs> Tanya and Bernard are hard at the phone. In the time that I have a lot of me, I'm going to try and sing as many of that 6,000 as I can. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> settlement along the coast of South Carolina discovered that rice would grow in the low country. But they didn't know beans about growing rice. So they used the Africans that they had brought from regions of Africa to cultivate what became known as yellow gold. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land where I'm bound. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land where I'm bound. Now, the music of the ancestors is called the spirituals. They're called spirituals because of the deep religious meanings that they hold. Now, during the growing season, the ancestors would use the spirituals to set the pace of work. When the song was done fast, the pace of work was fast. When the song was done slower, the pace of work was slower. And sometimes that slow pace was used when they had to rest and were not allowed to stop. Now, one of the songs that might have been used in the field to be used as a rhythm, because it's, it's almost about the rhythm, was a song entitled, Heist the Wind in Nora. It is a Gullah expression that means, open the window. Now, the phrase is referring to a story of Nora in the Ark, Noah in the Ark. And Noah used the dove to determine whether the floodwaters had receded. Now, if the dove could not find anywhere to settle, he would come back to the ark. And Nora would open the window and let the dove come in. Come in, 
Ice the wind, let the dove come in. Ice the wind, let the dove come in. Now some of the spirituals were also used as coded message songs. When they talked about freedom, the ancestors did so in code. Wade in the water is about escaping from slavery. It means wait in the water. A successful escape was not without its perils. Even if one was able to elude the hound dogs by hiding in the nearby water, there was still the possibility of being attacked by whatever was hiding in that water. But because freedom was the most important thing on their minds. And I tell young people this, it didn't matter. That's the price that they paid in order to, to, to be free. The song makes mention of the story of Moses and the Israelite children. sounds like, I will tell you a story. Do not stop me, Bernard, if you've heard it before. <laughs> this is a story about two deer hunters. These gentlemen were coming together in the South to do some deer hunting. Now, deer hunting, as I understand it, goes like this. You spread out a blanket of corn cobs or apples or whatever. In this case, it's going to be corn cobs. And two or more full-grown men hiding something not much bigger than a Barbie dollhouse. And they wait for deer to come to the corn. And when the deer comes to the corn in the middle of the corn, they shoot the deer. Ladies, they call that deer hunting. <laughs> now the northerner, you know, he's from the north, he speaks no Gullah. But the southerner does speak Gullah. So they've been waiting for the deer to come, and no deer had come. So the northerner is looking to his southern deer hunting companion with a comment and a question. He says, sir, there are no deer coming to this corn. Are we going to have to continue wait, waiting for the deer to come to this corn? And the southerner said to him, that's right. So he waits a little while longer. Still no deer come to the corn, none. none. And the northerner is getting even more antsier than he was before. 
And again, he looks to his southern deer hunting companion with the same comment and question. Sir, there are no deer coming to this corn. Are we going to have to continue to wait for the deer to come to this corn? And the southerner said, that's right. Again, they wait. No deer was coming to the corn. Again, he looks, the southerner look, northerner looks to his southern companion with the same comment and question. Sir, there are no deer coming to this corn. And the southerner said, <laughs> he said, I don't understand. I don't even understand why we are out here. No deer has come to the corn. In fact, a possum came along, and it took about three ears of corn and ran off into the bush. A raccoon came by and took some ear of corn, and it went running off into the bush. And what looked like two College of Charleston students. <laughs> They didn't care about the corn, but they took the beer we had hidden in the bush. <laughs> now, are you telling me we're still going to have to wait for the deer to come to the corn? The southerner said, that's right, that's right. He said, all right, tell me, why, tell me why can't we just go to another part of, of out here and just set up someplace else? Tell me why we cannot do that. So the Southern is going to tell him exactly why they're not going to do that. And I quote, Diddy Diddy, that the Diddy Diddy did. But the Diddy Diddy, that the Diddy Diddy did. And all of those guys said, Come again. So he says, Come again. The Diddy Diddy did, that the Diddy Diddy did. But the day they did, that the day, the day they did. <laughs> Northern looks at him and says, you speak English, don't you? <laughs> Southern said, that's right. <laughs> he said, well, tell me in English what you just said. So the Southern translates for him. The day that the deer is there, that's the day they're not there. But the day that they are there, that's the day the deer is not there. <laughs> no, I'm say, hold on a minute, I think I got it. Let me know if I got it correct. The day the day day, <laughs> that the day day day. But the day day day, that the day the day day. And the southerner said, <laughs> Slavery came to the short, well, I missed one, I missed one, I missed one. No, I don't like this part. I, I'm not going to flip through that. Now, the way of escape from slavery was called the Underground Railroad. Now, this wasn't really a railroad, and it wasn't really underground. It was the journey from slavery to freedom. I kind of think of the Middle Passage as the journey from freedom to slavery. And the ancestors would use code words to describe the process of escaping from slavery. The code name for the Maple Leaf train was called the chariot. The code name for Canada was home, heaven, Canaan, and promised land. The guides were called conductors. And the most famous conductor was Harriet Tubman. Her code name was Moses. Now the phrase, I ain't got long to stay here, I don't have long to stay here, does not necessarily mean dying. It could have meant that the enslaved ancestor was embarking on his or her quest to find freedom. To make that happen, one had to steal away under a blanket of darkness in order to board the chariot. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away. I ain't got love 
and existed for 246 years. January 31st, 1865, the Civil War and slavery had come to an end. June 19th, 1866, was the first anniversary of what is called, what is called Juneteenth. It's the combination of June and 19th. It's the celebration of the emancipation of Africans in America. The freedom they looked for, longed for, had finally come to meet them. But there would be still many, 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 many more hurdles to cross. I want y'all to help me with this song, because you're going to have to clap your hands. Some of y'all already know how to do that. <laughs> Say if you know it. I'm on my way to freedom land. I'm on my way to freedom land. I'm on my way to freedom 